I'm going to hit go live. All right. Hello. Thank you all for joining this week's seminar from the Living Earth Collaborative and Washington University's Ecology, Evolution, and Population Biology Group. Today, I have the uh, great pleasure of introducing Dr. Thomas Anderson. Dr. Anderson recently joined the community of researchers here in St. Louis as a faculty member just across the river at, St. Louis, uh, at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Prior to that, Dr. Anderson first earned his bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. He then earned a master's degree at Murray State University with Dr. Howard Whiteman, and then moved on uh, and earned a PhD with the late great uh, amphibian ecologist, uh, Dr. Ray Samlich at the University of Missouri. Following his time at Mizzou, Dr. Anderson held po uh, postdoctoral positions at the University of Kansas, at the Eastern Missouri State University, and Appalachian State University. As you'll hear today, Dr. Anderson's work incorporates lab, field, and mathematical approaches to understand how population and community dynamics are determined by interactions among things like phenology, species interactions, and phenotypic plasticity. He studies a variety of organisms, including salamanders, freshwater plankton, and even the occasional white-tailed deer. This research has led to an impressive uh, profile of publications in some of our field's most prestigious journals, such as Ecology Letters, Ecology, and Ecological Applications. Collectively, Dr. Anderson's work is providing really key insight into the biotic and abiotic factors that shape our freshwater ecosystems, and it's going to be really exciting to see where he takes his research next. On a more personal level, after Tom graduated from Murray State and moved on to Mizzou, I was the new graduate student that took over his desk in Howard Whiteman's lab. And for at least the first year and a half that I was there, I was rather frequently reminded that I had some pretty big shoes to fill. And trying to live up to the very high standard that Tom set for all of the graduate students in the lab certainly was a major influence on the biologist that I've become, as well as the biologist that other uh, lab alumni have come uh, in the time since as well. Now, before I hand it over to Dr. Anderson, I just want to remind everyone watching at home that they should leave questions and comments for Dr. Anderson in the chat section next to the screen, and we'll relay them uh, to him at the end of the seminar. I should also mention that, uh, that those of you that plan to join us for our book club discussion, A Terrible Thing to Waste by, Dr., uh, by Harriet Washington, should remember to fill out the poll uh, by tomorrow. And so now without any further ado, uh, why don't we all give a warm virtual welcome uh, to Dr. Thomas Anderson. Tom? Hi, hey, Mike. Thanks for that introduction and for the uh, invitation to speak here today. I'm excited to share um, a lot of my um, work with you that I've been doing over the past uh, five years or so and um, sort of what drives or motivates me in terms of the types of questions I'm interested in in uh, aquatic ecology. And so um, I think along a continuum um, in terms of uh, the types of uh, questions that I am interested in span a demographic variability continuum. And so this continuum can be anything from the uh, processes and interactions that are occurring over short time scales. So interactions between species that might happen over the course of an hour or a day, all the way up to um, how demography varies across really long time scales. And so this can be uh, many months to years or decades. And so there's been a lot of work, you know, on these different um, uh, temporal resolution, uh, these this, this different temporal resolution for um, species interactions or abiotic influences, such as things like the functional response or um, foraging trials of a single predator on varying densities of prey that might occur over, you know, the span of a couple of days all the way up to things that are occurring over really long time scales, like the classic um, cyclic dynamics of um, links up in Canada. And um, dem demographic variability occurs also across large spatial gradients as well. And um, a lot of the work that I've done has focused on looking at things that occur both locally as well as across regional patterns um, in demography. And so um, there's again been a lot of work that's been done that really hones in on a single location or a single population that can really uncover strong dynamics for um, a given um, place. And so things like the Savannah River Ecology Lab um, that documented the amount of amphibian biomass that left a given wetland in one year, you know, was a single population in a single year that generated really strong insights into how um, demography can vary. 
So to contrast that with, again, a links example. So if we look at the number of links, um, estimates of the population of links in Canada across different regions, and now this combines not only spatial, but also um, temporal variability. And um, these are the types of things that uh, my later work that I'm going to be talking about in my talk today span these sorts of large spatial temporal gradients where it's many years and many locations. And so uh, documenting these, this demographic variability is sort of insufficient for um, a lot of us and that not only just to show that demographic variability exists is important, but also what drives it. So what is the causal mechanism that might shape why survival of an organism might um, go from one day to the next or why, um, what sort of mechanism would drive this long-term variability um, in something like cyclic population dynamics. And as is often the case in um, community ecology, especially things that can affect these mechanisms or the context in which they occur often drive um, these, uh, these patterns to be generated. And so um, there's often different mediating factors that can influence species interactions across these demographic scales. And so for example, if we were interested in a simple three species food web here represented by the, the orange, the red and the yellow dots that might interact with each other, those interactions might change when placed within the context of a much larger food web. Similarly, um, abiotic constraints can um, play a critical role as a mediating factor or shape the uh, context in which um, these dynamics play out. So for example, if we again imagine our three um, species food um, module here, a food web module playing out in a pond like the top picture that has you know, roughly no vegetation and is a relatively simplified physical environment versus one like the bottom picture that um, has much more structural complexity and might elicit a different outcome to something like species interactions. And so trying to understand these um, different uh, context is an important goal within uh, population and community ecology. And ultimately, we hope that by trying to unravel these different mediating factors, we can learn things about basic ecology or conservation actions or things that might end up having um, societal impacts based on the organisms that we work with. And so this is the um, type of work that I've been interested in really since starting graduate school up through uh, my current position as an assistant professor where I've looked at some of the mechanisms that drive demographic variability at these different time scales, so short to long time scales, as well as for more localized interactions versus how demography varies across many locations um, across time. And while I've worked on a lot of different organisms, like Mike said at the beginning, um, the, the key um, organisms that I focused on a lot are um, pond breeding amphibians and in particular salamanders. Um, and so today, um, what I'm going to be talking about is how um, these different uh, mechanisms of demographic variability can occur under different contexts and across multiple scales. And so for the first part of my talk, I'm going to be summarizing a lot of work that I've done on the spotted salamander and some of its demographic and life history traits um, as they vary across uh, these more shorter time scales as well as more local spatial scales. Then in the second half of my talk, I'm going to talk more about this long time scale pattern um, in zooplankton as it occurs over many decades at different locations um, in a large reservoir. Then I'll talk a little bit about sort of where my um, research is um, headed these days. So to focus, first focus on this um, part on salamanders. So the spotted salamander is a species that's ubiquitous across much of the eastern United States. You can see its distribution here. Um, and uh, in Missouri, where much of my work has occurred on the spotted salamander, they um, often inhabit areas in and around ponds that look like this. And so amphibians and the spotted salamander um, especially has a uh, complex life cycle, meaning that it has both a terrestrial and aquatic part of its life. And that life stage looks like this, where um, uh, adults live on the terrestrial landscape and um, they migrate to ponds to breed in the early spring, lay aquatic eggs like this picture here. Those legs develop in ponds for several months and then transition to, uh, or the eggs hatch into larvae. The larvae hang out in the ponds for a couple months before they undergo metamorphosis into these terrestrial juvenile stages where they remain in the terrestrial environment for up to several years before they return to the same pond that they were born in to breed again as an adult. And so what most of my work is focused on is looking at variability in the egg and larval stages. 
And so those are the two main research questions I'm going to ask or answer in this part of the talk is sort of what drives variation in survival of egg and larval stages. And then I'm also going to look at some life history traits like larval and metamorphic body size. And so this work is going to summarize numerous um, projects that I did using both observational and experimental data. And so most of the observational data comes from our field site in southern Missouri, Fort Leonard Wood. And much of this work over the last 10 years has been funded through um, a variety of uh, Department of Defense CERTIP grants. And then the um, rest of the work is going to be um, summarizing some both indoor microcosm experiments as well as some outdoor mesocosm experiments. So to jump right into some of the data. So the um, field work that we've done at Fort Leonard Woods started um, back in 2011. And it just so happened that very early on in this um, field study that we were doing, um, uh, it happened to be a really strong drought year. And so one of the things that we had been doing as part of our ongoing uh, research activities was recording the presence of spotted salamander egg masses in around 190 populations. And um, because this drought happened the very first year of the study, it allowed us to um, sort of have a natural um, comparison to subsequent years in terms of um, things like embryonic mortality and other um, life history traits. So in 2013 was a more typical year in terms of precipitation and so um, characterized as a non-drought year. And essentially what we did was just go out and record the presence of spotted salamander egg masses in these ponds. And so if you look at the two years side by side in terms of the number of ponds that contained egg masses in them, you can see that it was just over 50% in each of the two years that initially had eggs in them at the start um, of the breeding season that we um, were able to observe. But then if you look at the number of ponds that dried prematurely, and this was prematurely before the eggs even hatched, the number of ponds that dried prematurely was around 33% in this drought year. So a third of these um, ponds um, dried that had eggs in them. So basically a third um, of them, third of the populations had reproductive failure entirely for um, this year. If you contrast that to 2013, which is again, a typical precipitation year around 10%. So, you know, a threefold difference in embryonic mortality simply from the ponds drying prior to the eggs even hatching. And that sort of visually show you what the landscape looked like under these different scenarios. So the picture on the left shows the same pond as the one on the right, but what they looked like during both a drought and non-drought year at about the same, same time point um, uh, in the spring. So egg, uh, egg survival or egg hatching rates are strongly impacted by um, the hydro period or drought cycles um, that occur in our region. So moving on now to the larval stage. So one of the things that I was really interested in for my um, graduate work and then beyond was the impact of uh, predation among larval salamander species. And in particular in Missouri, we have a species called the ring salamander that's an endemic species to the Ozark and Wachita mountains. And this species is unique among many um, pond breeding salamanders because it has uh, its life cycle occurs um, uh, starting in the fall where adults migrate to ponds to breed in the fall rather than the spring, which is what most amphibians um, do. And so because the adults breed in the fall, the larvae then hang out in the ponds over the winter and they can grow to be a much larger size than most of the other amphibians that are breeding in the spring. And to show, to show an example of this, the bottom uh, salamander in this picture is a ring salamander larva that had been hanging out in a pond all winter, contrasting that with a spotted salamander larva that had just recently hatched into this pond. And so you can see that substantial size difference that um, would potentially elicit uh, uh, or potentially promote ring salamanders from being an effective predator on um, spotted salamanders. And so I did a series of experiments manipulating different factors that I thought might influence um, this outcome of um, potential predation among these species or sort of manipulating the different contexts under which these interactions might occur. And so the first study I did is I manipulated the predator density. So I manipulated the number of these ring salamander larvae that was inside different uh, mesocosms. And so spanning um, a range of densities from them not being present at all all the way up to adding 24 um, ring salamander larvae. And then we looked at the number of spotted salamanders that survived out of these tanks. And so we added a constant density of spotted salamanders to each tank and then looked at the number that survived all the way to metamorphosis. 
And as you might imagine, um, as you increase the number of predators or the number of these ring salamander larvae, the number of spotted salamanders substantially declines almost to zero when you have 24 of the large ring salamander predators in the system. Um, and so uh, perhaps expected that these uh, predators are more effective when there are more of them, but something that was um, uh, interesting to us, um, I should mention uh, first off that I failed to at the beginning of the slide, um, the, uh, my undergraduate student that worked with me on this project, Lauren Smith, who um, contributed substantially to, the, to working on this project. Um, so anyways, the interesting thing about this was that if we look at the body size of the metamorphs that did survive out of this experiment, and so in this case, you know, the 5% um, uh, or so that did survive, those individuals metamorphosed or underwent metamorphosis at a much larger body size than individuals that had fewer predators. And essentially what's going on here is the uh, ring salamander predators were thinning out the prey population. So thinning out the spotted salamander population and the ones that did survive uh, were able to um, experience reduced intraspecific competition, releasing them from those effects and allowing them to achieve larger body sizes at metamorphosis. So this manipulation looked at the uh, varying the number of predators. Sort of the next thing we got curious about was manipulating the number of prey in the system. So manipulating the abundance of spotted salamanders. And so in the next study um, with um, my two undergraduate co-authors, um, Christina and Caitlin, we manipulated both the number of prey that a given uh, ring salamander was able to forage on at a given time. So ranging from um, four individuals all the way up to 50 individuals. And then we uh, crossed those manipulations with um, whether or not there was a large ring salamander or a small ring salamander predator doing the foraging on those different prey densities. And so for those of you that are um, more familiar with community ecology, this will look familiar to you as basically a test of the functional response of ring salamanders. And you can see that large ring salamander predators um, foraged with what's called a type one functional response. Essentially, they could keep foraging no matter how many prey we offered them. And within a 24 hour span, they ate almost um, all 50 of the spotted salamander hatchlings they were given to eat and contrast that with small ring salamander predators that they initially started out foraging at a relatively similar level as the large predators, but eventually became satiated at these high predator, or sorry, high prey density. So a type two functional response. So this combination of prey density and predator size greatly impacts how many um, spotted salamanders would make it out of a given pond. And so primarily then these, uh, these questions have focused just on pairwise interactions between ring salamanders and spotted salamanders. But um, as we all know, most communities are composed of more than just two species. And in fact, are often uh, uh, when looking at pairwise interactions, they're embedded within much more complex communities. And so that was the next step then that I took to look at um, how ring salamander, spotted salamander interactions played out um, in the uh, when exposed to a more natural um, community and pond ecosystems. And so in this case, we comp combined our two focal salamanders either with a adult red spotted newt, a large eschnid dragonfly, or a mosquito fish or several mosquito fish. We then crossed this with adding this additional habitat complexity, which um, was to mimic cattails that might occur in half the pond. And so um, sort of crossing these two uh, food web complexity and habitat complexity treatments. And so the graph that's showing up here is whether um, in the colors and uh, up here in the black and yellow shows whether or not this extra cover was present or absent. So yes or no for it's there or not there. And then this again is the um, number of prey or spotted salamanders that survived to metamorphosis in this experiment. And then the bottom axis is the number of ring salamanders that survived. And so this was our control treatment where um, it was just these two focal salamanders. So um, ring salamanders, um, again, had a substantial impact on the survival of um, uh, spotted salamanders. But when we add in these extra predators, as well as these um, complexity treatments, we see very different relationships sometimes. And so when we add in things like mosquito fish, that looks relatively similar to what it looks like when the mosquito fish was absent. And so they did not have large impacts on the relationship between our two focal salamanders. 
If you contrast that with red spotted newts and dragonflies, you can see that the combination of habitat complexity and these predators resulted in very different relationships to where when the cover was there, we see a strong negative relationship. Whereas when the cover was not there, we see more or less no relationship existing between the species anymore. And so when placing these um, uh, pairwise interactions within these more um, realistic communities, we can start to see that relationships are not always constant. And so that led us then to start looking at these questions in uh, more natural systems. And so I mentioned we've been doing a lot of work at Fort Leonard Wood, and this is a great place to sort of understand these interactions because they have um, a large number of ponds that occur um, at the site. And so Fort Leonard Wood, um, from 2012 to 2014, we monitored around 200 ponds and ponds is a loose term that would encompass things like wildlife ponds that I showed at the beginning, as well as tank ruts or impact craters from when the military would blow stuff up. And so um, the 200 ponds that I'm gonna be talking about today for over that three year time span will be results I show, but we have been doing ongoing surveying since 2012 um, up to the present. So this is in collaboration with a wide number of folks that um, I was uh, either a graduate student with or a postdoc with. Um, and uh, so this was a very large team collaborative effort to collect all of these data. And so what we basically did at Fort Leonard Wood was go out and sample these 200 ponds using a combination of dip nets and minnow traps. We surveyed ponds both in March, right after or during when spotted salamanders would be breeding, as well as in June at about the two thirds of the waypoint for most of the larvae. So we could gather information about larval body size. We recorded the abundances of pretty much everything else that we caught, um, and then also uh, measured body size of a lot of the organisms. We measured a variety of habitat variables over these years. So things like hydro period or how long the pond holds water, the amount of canopy cover over wetlands and the amount of vegetation within the ponds. And then I used structural equation modeling to assess the impacts of um, a variety of different organisms as well as these habitat variables on the abundance and body size of spotted salamanders. And so, um, uh, the full complex model that we fit using structural equation modeling look like this, where all of the arrows that are pointing from one of these boxes to another indicates a potential or hypothesized causal relationship. And so the, um, all of the names up here are different organisms in the blue, um, uh, gray, and um, pink boxes, and then habitat variables in the green boxes. And then all of them and how they relate to our focal species, the uh, A. maculatum, which is spotted salamander, as well as their body size. And so I'm just gonna show you um, sort of the uh, part of the results that were most important from this graph rather than going through all of this. Um, but the key thing um, for explaining body size and um, abundance of spotted salamander larvae. So first, Spotted salamander abundance had a strong negative effect on their own body size, so indications of intraspecific competition. The next largest impact on their abundance and body size was from these eschnid dragonflies, so one of the species that I manipulated in the experiments. So they had a strong negative effect on spotted salamander abundance, as well as a negative effect on their body size. And so it's unclear whether or not that effect on body size is because they were competing with spotted salamanders for food or if they were um, limiting their movement um, uh, by forcing some sort of non-consumptive effect. But the interesting thing is because they had, uh, dragonfly larvae had a strong negative effect on their abundance and their abundance had a strong negative effect on body size through this relationship, you can see using structural equation modeling that um, these dragonfly larvae had a positive indirect effect on body size of larvae. Basically when there were more dragonfly predators, the body size was larger because they were uh, thinning out the number of larvae that were present. And if this sounds familiar, that's because this is a relationship that I already showed um, a couple slides ago in an experiment, though using ring salamanders as a predator rather than dragonflies. So some of the other main impacts on spotted salamander body size and abundance came from red spotted newts. So a strong negative effect on body size indicating competition. There's also a really strong positive effect of canopy cover over wetlands on the abundance of um, spotted salamanders. So a strong positive effect on abundance. But again, because all of these relationships are linked between the abundance of 
uh, spotted salamanders and their body size, this ends up having a negative indirect effect of canopy cover on their body size. So more canopy equals more larvae, more larvae equals smaller body size. And then finally, um, we found strong effects of hydroperiod, again, both direct and indirect effects on both abundance and body size. And we were able to explain a fair amount of the variation in the system with um, uh, the full model we ended up fitting, though less so on the abundance of spotted salamanders. So just to sort of summarize this section of the talk, um, so we found a lot of different variables impacting larval dynamics. So things like predator and prey density, body size of predators, the fo uh, food web complexity or the types of habitats that they occur in, as well as what predator species is present. So not all predators had equivalent impacts. So to go back to our two research questions, um, uh, what drives variation in survival and abundance of eggs and larvae? So combinations of biotic and abiotic interactions. And then body size is explained by combinations of competition and predation, but again, depending on the context in which they occur and whether or not there are these indirect effects that propagate through the system. And so through this part of the talk, um, uh, I feel like a common theme has that it's sort of the answer is it depends. And that's um, something that's been sort of complained about in community ecology a lot, enough that um, about 20 years ago was uh, a lot, uh, had one author calling community ecology a mess. And so um, while I agree definitely that community ecology is um, difficult to study and complex because of all these contingencies, um, I'd look at it with the glass um, half full viewpoint that um, you know, trying to unravel all of these complexities is needed because then it can help us better understand how species change in things like abundance um, through time or to better understand their demography and their position or role in a given food web. And that I think feedbacks between field observations and experiments are critical to be able to see whether or not consistencies are present in these systems. And I think it's also interesting um, from a lot of this work that we've done on um, uh, amphibians is that um, different demographic variables can be affected by different processes or in opposing manner by the same process. So things like larval survival are affected by a large number of things, but something like predator density affects it negatively, but then predator density can also have positive effects on body size. And so basically, effects can have both positive and negative effects depending on the demographic variable of interest. And so the other way that I view a lot of this work and how it's complex and difficult to unravel is that all of these things are needed, especially now to try and project how species interactions are gonna change under future climate change scenarios. And so understanding what they're like now to be able to predict what they might be like in the future. And so much of this part of the talk is focused on this um, shorter time scale. So things like survival over the course of a few weeks or days, as well as, you know, smaller population level studies. But um, really, it's more interesting in many ways to try and understand how does this translate into effects that happen over the long term? So over decades, as well as across many populations. And so that's the second part of my talk working on amphibians for that long. Um, I'm not there yet. So uh, hopefully maybe in another 20 years, I'll have some information about their long-term dynamics. But um, in the absence of that, we're gonna shift now to talking about zooplankton. And so um, for much of my postdoctoral work um, and stuff that I'm continuing to work on um, was working on something called spatial synchrony. And so spatial synchrony is, um, uh, described as correlated fluctuations in abundance across space. And so across space, meaning multiple populations and through time. And so this is sort of an idealized scenario that I'm showing here where there's four populations and the fluctuations are going in perfect unison up and down. It's not always that um, nice and neat, but this is sort of the general characterization of what it could look like. And so this is something that's been documented in a variety of taxa from plants to invertebrates and vertebrates, as well as a variety of um, other organisms. And so it's a really common thing that happens. And so there's sort of three accepted uh, mechanisms that produce synchronous patterns in population fluctuations. So things like dispersal among populations, mobile or synchronized predators can um, induce synchrony in some sort of prey population as well as synchronized environmental variables. So things like temperature that might affect um, four different populations in a similar way might bring those populations into synchrony. 
And so synchrony is important to understand for a variety of reasons. Um, for, from a conservation standpoint, if synchronous populations are all low at the same time, then some sort of catastrophic event could eliminate them all at once, essentially eliminating the possibility of rescue effects. There's a lot of ecological consequences. So things like oak masting or trees that produce large amounts of fruit at one time can have um, large ramifications for those food webs. Some recent work that I'm going to plug here. Um, so synchrony can lead to things like um, population cycles in um, at least we've demonstrated it to happen in white-tailed deer populations. And so synchrony can lead to cyclic dynamics. There's a large um, economic potential of spatial synchrony. So if things like um, pests are synchronized, they might cause greater outbreaks or cause more damage when they have outbreak years than when um, they um, are not synchronized. Similarly, in this paper that I'm showing the um, front of here, uh, the um, impacts that we saw of spatial synchrony in deer trans are transmitted to affecting deer vehicle collisions. And so again, something that has a strong economic value. And then um, changes in synchrony is also something that can be a strong indicator of climatic change. And this has been documented in um, a variety of taxa around the world. And so one of the ways that um, has been used historically to look at synchrony is to plot the correlation of time series of an organism's abundance from different locations against the pairwise distance of those two um, points. And so this is a figure from Krebs et al. that looked at the Pearson correlation of pairwise abundance fluctuations um, in snowshoe hares. And um, you can see both sort of the trend line as well as the individual data points on there indicating those pairwise comparisons of different populations. And so this is a typical pattern where the strength of synchrony declines as you increase the distance between populations. And this occurs because they're less likely to share um, dispersers among populations the further apart away they are. Then um, you're also less likely to have synchronized predators moving among populations, and you're less likely to be impacted by the same environmental fluctuations the further two populations are apart. But what information is lacking from this kind of um, assessment of spatial synchrony? And so these plots of correlation do not say much about what I'm gonna call the structure of synchrony. And so if we look at a subset of populations here that are all correlated about um, 0.8 in terms of their Pearson correlation um, for those time series. And so they're all correlated the same strength, but they span a variety of distances from each other. And so what explains this variability? So similarly, if we take a slice at one geographic distance, we see some populations are correlated above 0.75, whereas others are negatively correlated. And so what explains this difference in correlation when they should, in theory, based on the expectations of this kind of uh, analysis, you know, what produces this? And it's also difficult using um, this sort of method to distinguish drivers of synchrony. Oftentimes you're left with trying to align plots of um, Pearson correlations among population time series with driver time series. And it's sort of um, difficult to really discern what's going on. And so that led um, to some work that I was able to contribute to um, uh, while I was a postdoc that was called um, the geography of synchrony, which uh, essentially breaks down into being able to describe the spatial variation in synchrony, or why are some pairs of populations more synchronized than others. And so it's important to point out that this is um, potentially distinct from the actual mechanisms of synchrony. It's more looking at which populations are synchronized um, and then hoping to get at why they're synchronized as well. But it's more about trying to align the spatial patterning. Why are the blue ones more similar than the green ones in this picture? So um, we looked at this using um, a system of zooplankton and phytoplankton um, in Kentucky Lake, which I'll describe in a second, to look at the strength of synchrony. And then also, um, are there things that are better than this geographic distance that could explain these geographic patterns of synchrony? And so this was in collaboration with staff um, at the Hancock Biological Station on Kentucky Lake. That's uh, part of Murray State University. And um, uh, in collaboration with um, my postdoc advisor, Dan Ruman, as well as other collaborators um, at KU. So Kentucky Lake, for some background information, is the uh, largest reservoir in the Eastern United States. 
So staff at the Hancock Biological Station have been sampling 16 locations um, on Kentucky Lake every 16 days since around 1990. And the data I'm gonna use um, is from April to November, or the approximate growing season over this time period. Um, data collection is ongoing. I'm only using the 26 years um, shown here. And they sample these uh, different locations shown on the map where um, some of the locations shown in blue here are in the main former channel or riverbed of um, Kentucky Lake. Some of them drain primarily forested landscapes on the east side, which are the green symbols, primarily agricultural land on the orange symbols, and then the four red symbols that represent um, this embayment that they take samples in. And so by sampling, they take uh, biotic samples and uh, enumerating zooplankton that they catch. And so I'm going to be focusing on seven zooplankton species or groups today, rather. And then uh, chlorophyll A as well. And so I'm using chlorophyll A as a proxy for the amount of phytoplankton biomass. They do a variety of abiotic sampling on all of these sampling trips and recording things like temperature and pH, conductivity, nitrogen, um, secchi depth, pretty much every standard limnological technique that um, folks would do if they've been collecting those data. And so I took all of these data and created annualized and detrended time series for each of these 16 locations. And so I had 16 locations for 26 years worth of data. So just to show you so, some of the raw data looks like. And so this is a figure of five of the different zooplankton groups um, in the, the four boxes on the left and then the one up here in the upper right. Um, and the abundance fluctuations that each of those organisms have across the 26 years of that study. And then down here in the bottom right is the fluctuations in phytoplankton abundance um, through time. And the colors on here represent those different sampling locations that I mentioned, whether or not it was draining primarily agricultural or forested landscapes um, or elsewhere. And uh, I'm not gonna talk too much about those locations anymore other than to point out we didn't um, see strong differences among those groups. And so um, uh, uh, we uh, didn't do much further with the, them in the analysis. And so this just sort of gives you an idea of the variability and the fluctuations of some of the more common taxa that we see out there. So if we make plots that are similar to the one that I showed previously in my examples at the beginning, we can see um, what the Spearman correlation is for our seven zooplankton, as well as our phytoplankton biomass or our chlorophyll A samples in the upper left corner. And so this is again, the Spearman correlation on the y-axis and then the Euclidean distance or the, the straight line geographic distance between points um, up to 25 kilometers, which is about how far the furthest two points were from each other. And so each point represents a pairwise correlation between time series at those points. And so the key takeaway from all of these graphs um, is that more or less these lines go straight across, meaning there's no decline with distance, which is sort of atypical for um, synchrony studies, but maybe wouldn't be expected given that all these um, species are living in the same um, reservoir, even if they are spatially separated by quite large distances. But the other thing to note um, that uh, in addition to the fact that they don't decline with distance is that there's still a substantial amount of variability in synchrony for these organisms. And so you can see the mean values, the mean correlation here at the top for each um, group, but the spread around some of these spans, you know, for phytoplankton biomass spans 0.8 all the way down to 0.2. So we're looking then at trying to explain this variability um, with some sort of better predictor variable than just Euclidean distance. So what explains this variability? And so the four things that we hypothesize might be going on here um, is one of them would be the degree to which these different sites are connected um, uh, in the, the lake. And so while it's a reservoir, it has a really um, quick, um, uh, it has a really low retention time that the retention time of the lake is only um, uh, about a month, if I remember correctly. Um, so really short retention time. So there's a high volume of water that flows through this system that could impact the ability of zooplankton to make it potentially, you know, from one side of the lake to another. And so we created what we hypothesized as um, a proxy for dispersal based on the movements of the water that would impact whether or not it would be likely for a zooplankton to be able to get from one place to the next. So I'll just be referring to this as dispersal. 
we looked at spatial variation in the environment. And so we took all of those abiotic variables and collapsed them down into um, two principal components analyses that um, we then used to try and explain the spatial variation in synchrony with spatial variation in the environment. We looked at spatial variation in the strength of density dependence. And so we generated this metric by looking at the um, a regression of population abundance for a given zooplankton in um, the current year versus the year um, uh, uh, after that. And so be able to take the regression coefficient from this um, relationship and plug that in as an estimate of density dependence. And then we used this, uh, used all these variables against our sort of null expectation, which was Euclidean distance. And so uh, while we were, while I was a postdoc at Kansas, I was able to help out with developing um, uh, uh, or worked on me uh, new methods to try and understand um, ways to understand this geography of synchrony approach. And so this utilized um, a standard approach of something called matrix regression on distance matrices. And so this is similar to something like a Mantel test, but allows you to plug in uh, more uh, variables beyond just distance. And so you essentially create a multiple regression equation with um, uh, distance matrices as all of your variables going in. And then we developed a way to look at something akin to AIC model selection, but using leave um, and out cross-validation and resampling procedures to generate what would be the most likely predictors for um, uh, geography of synchrony in each of our focal species or taxa. And so I'm going to show all of the results of this um, uh, sort of tabularly. And so I have our list of all of our um, focal species here on the left. So phytoplankton and then our seven zooplankton. And then we have our uh, predictor variables in terms of uh, Euclidean distance, dispersal, density, dependence, and then our um, environmental variables that we use both the first and second principal component and uh, axes for this analysis. And so the uh, first thing that I want to show is that three of the zooplankton were um, best predicted, their uh, geography of synchrony was best predicted by our hypothesis of how dispersal moved things around in the system. And these are red, meaning that the further uh, or the more difficult it was for an organism to disperse between them, the um, lower the synchrony value was. The uh, two species shown here had a negative relationship between synchrony and the strength of density dependence. And then our final two species had, uh, our final two uh, predictor variables were important for two of our taxa where they were positively correlated with one of the two um, principal component analyses. And so uh, two of the species, you can see that we did not come up with a good predictor. So they, despite showing um, strong variability and synchrony, none of our predictors were good at explaining why that occurred for Bosmina and Diaphanosoma. But the rest of them, we came up with um, uh, somewhat good explanatory variables for what um, was going on with explaining this geography of synchrony. And just to sort of show some graphically, uh, show graphically what some of these responses looked like. And so if we look at calanoid copepods, for example, that were predicted by the degree of dispersal difficulty, um, you can see that as dispersal difficulty increases to the right, that the degree of synchrony goes down. Um, similarly, when the environmental similarity goes up, um, uh, then um, synchrony goes up for this other species, Leptodora. And phytoplankton, um, when two sites were more similar in their strength of density dependence, their synchrony values were more similar. So to summarize um, the results from this part of the talk, um, so the strength of synchrony or, or, phyto, or strength of phytoplankton and zooplankton synchrony in Kentucky Lake was really high, but um, varied by species in terms of how high, as well as how much variability there was. And we did a pretty good job of explaining the, why these geographic patterns exist for most of the taxa, though there were a couple that we couldn't explain. Um, and the actual driver of synchrony varied depending on which species um, it was. And I think this is interesting because all of these zooplankton were living in the same lake, but they were um, being um, affected by different things in different ways over the same time span. And so, you know, I think as more studies adopt this approach to looking at things like geography of synchrony, 
um, we'll be able to uncover some really interesting insights as to why certain locations are more correlated with other locations. And so um, all of this uh, information on uh, Kentucky Lake, I think has contributed to a better understanding of why populations are synchronized. And so things like dispersal or similarity and density dependence or the environment, uh, environmental conditions can all uh, contribute to explaining um, the spatial patterning. And as I mentioned, the geography of synchrony can vary among species within the same landscape or in our case, a waterscape as can its mechanisms. And I don't have time necessarily to go into potential hypotheses as to why the different species varied in the mechanisms. Um, and we don't fully know because it is observational data, but it could be things attributed to life history or their sensitivity to the environment, their susceptibility to predators. Um, there's probably a variety of other potential mechanisms. So one thing that I think is really interesting is that synchrony can vary over really short distances. So this is the same lake, 25 kilometers, and some of these points were really um, close together, only a couple of kilometers away. And so the fact that um, synchrony can vary over this relatively short distance um, and subsequent work with um, some of the same co-authors from uh, KU have shown that it can occur in even shorter distances over tens of meters um, in plants, you know, that this is sort of an interesting phenomenon that needs to be looked at further. And so um, again, yeah, something that um, I think needs to be tackled um, in a little bit greater detail now that we have better statistical tools to, to work on it. And so to assess some overall general conclusions. So um, perhaps unsurprisingly, but I think that is still interesting is that demographic variability. So things like survival rates or abundance or um, including things like life history traits like body size, um, can be generated, um, the patterns in those things can be generated by a variety of mechanisms, but only some of those things are consistent across space and time. And that trying to build in these more context dependent investigations are needed so that we can predict um, uh, how patterns might unfold in the future, both for these more local scales, as well as these more regional scales. So trying to understand why certain populations are more um, correlated with each other, as well as, you know, the contexts that might produce certain predator-prey relationships that would occur differently in other habitats and those sorts of things. And as I said before, understanding all of these um, contingencies can help inform what might happen with certain environmental changes that occur um, with global climate change or habitat modification or other um, sorts of issues that are going on. And that hopefully by understanding the current patterns of species interactions or abundance fluctuations might help better predict future ones. Um, some of the work hopefully can help inform management if we better understand why certain populations fluctuate the way they do. Hopefully they can lead to better informed decisions about how to best um, preserve them or otherwise manage them. And that, um, you know, I, my work integrates a lot of different approaches to try and understand how and why populations and communities vary across these different um, spatial and temporal scales. So in the last minute here, I'm just going to just briefly mention sort of what I'm doing now um, with a lot of my work. And so the uh, I'm continuing a lot of work on population and community dynamics in ponds. And in particular, I've sort of shifted my specific focus to how phenological change or the timing of certain biological activities like the timing of breeding impacts species interactions. And so that's the context that um, I'm investigating right now, specifically focusing on larval salamanders, as well as I'm continuing work just more generally on top-down effects of predators in pond communities. So in addition to this more experimentally focused work, um, the uh, other thing that um, I'm still um, uh, trying to do amidst a lot of the restrictions that are currently going on in the world amidst for field work, but is to continue to look at spatio-temporal variation in aquatic communities. And so this is looking at ponds, both at Fort Leonard Wood that I've already mentioned that we have you know, rough, roughly nine years of data now on 50 ponds, looking at things like demography and community ecology but also um, a current ongoing study that I have at um, Land Between the Lakes um, National Recreation Area in Kentucky, looking at um, sort of more evolutionary ecology aspects of salamanders, um, the effects on phenotypic plasticity in um, around 20 ponds for the last 10 years or so, and sort of continuing to look at how these long-term changes play out in these communities, um, looking at a different um, set of questions in each, um, each long-term study. <laughs> 
So with that, um, I have to thank a variety of people, especially funding agencies um, like the uh, Department of Defense, um, the institutions where a lot of this work took place at the University of Missouri as a graduate student, KU as a postdoc, and then my current um, location, as well as my previous postdoc stops at Appalachian State and Southeast Missouri State. A lot of the folks that helped do all the work, um, the salamander work and the synchrony work. And um, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. All right, thanks, Tom. That was um, that was really great, and I'm sure that there is a thunderous applause uh, going on collectively amongst all of the homes of the of the many people watching today. Um, so while we wait for some questions to roll in on the chat, I, I have a I have a couple uh, to sort of get us going. So the first is sort of a almost more of a natural history question, and and I was curious about what you think might be some of the evolutionary forces. Uh, that have caused the phenology of the ring salamanders to shift so much into the fall, and um, and why why spotted salamanders haven't also made that similar phenological shift, given the the, the really negative effects that the the ring salamanders have on the spotted salamanders. Mm -hmm. um, so, just to, to background for the folks that don't know, um, sort of a lot about amphibian ecology. So there's actually four species in this genus that breed in the fall. And so ring salamanders are one, marbled salamanders are more of a ubiquitous species that also do it across much of the Eastern United States. And then two species down in Florida, the flatwood salamanders. And so, um, you know, I think the easy explanation is that by trying to breed earlier that species would get an advantage in ponds. And so, you know, would lead to things like, um, priority effects. And then if that just sort of keeps shifting them early and earlier, that eventually they, you know, shift to breeding in the fall is sort of one hypothesis that I've talked with about colleagues. Uh, but, you know, the other sort of thing here that the, um, the other sort of shaping force on their life history that's sort of different, and this isn't necessarily an answer to your question, but just something different that they face in the fall that species in the spring don't deal with. And maybe it's a reason that, you know, they exploit it is that they start breeding in the fall when the temperatures start cooling down rather than warming up like they do in the spring. And so they can potentially be breeding in relatively warm temperatures. And so the ponds are more likely to potentially dry in the fall. That is a different pressure than the species in the spring breed, which they're worried about their eggs freezing. And so maybe they sort of shifted at some point evolutionarily to, um, to get away from that effect of spring breeding, but then got, you know, pinned on the other side by ponds drying because it's still potentially summer almost when they're breeding. And so those are the sorts of ideas. There's not really an answer that I know of that's um, substantially better. <laughs> Could you test some of that though, right? So with the ring salamanders, do the egg, is it like with the marbles where the eggs hatch once the ponds get flooded? And so you could sort of induce later hatching and compete and um, see what happens. So, uh, they lay aquatic eggs like a lot of other amphibians do. So they don't lay the terrestrial nests like marbled salamanders do. So it's a, a globular egg mass in the water. Um, and so it's, you can delay them to some degree, but not, you know, like months at a time or something like that. So, and I did try to do some of that for my dissertation work where I delayed hatching of them, but the, uh, they exhibited strong compensatory growth throughout the larval period to make up for that delay in breeding. And so um, because they basically have six months to um, hang out in the ponds, you know, they have, uh, I think, a great potential to deal with those sort of phenological shifts in the fall that maybe species in the spring don't. Excellent. Um, yeah, so actually we have a question from uh, Wenchi Kuo. Uh, she says, great talk. I'm still confused about how density dependent factor affects synchrony. Does it usually depend on the same species or interspecific interactions? Yeah, so um, the general idea for density dependence and synchrony is that um, sort of one of the assumptions is that populations um, are going to be synchronous if they exhibit, exhibit similar levels of um, the strength of density dependence. And so this would be within a species. So um, and so, uh, but we know that most populations probably don't exhibit similar strengths of density dependence, you know, across, you know, if you looked at 10 populations, the strength of density dependence is gonna vary among them. And so this was sort of um, a new um, approach to try and get at, is that variation in the strength of 
intraspecific density dependence, would that affect the degree to which they were synchronized? So populations that have really strong density dependence would be more synchronized with each other than populations that had less strong density dependence would be more synchronized with each other. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers uh, her question. I have one too. So I really appreciate your talk. Very, very awesome. Um, I, I, I've been thinking a lot about you know, chronobiology and how animals tune into different um, environmental cues for all of their biology. And I'm wondering, you know, you showed that really excellent uh, figure of the distance, like how far animals are apart from each other and how that affects the synchronization. So I'm wondering, do you think that distance, or maybe you know, is the distance, was that mostly like across the same latitude or is that because they're going either, you know, more towards the poles or more towards the equator? And you'd expect that, I think you'd expect that synchrony would go way down, right? There'd be less synchrony between individuals as you get closer to the tropics where you have less of uh, extreme environmental disturbance. It's a good question. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head whether or not there are latitudinal gradients present in synchrony, which is essentially what you're asking, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm asking. Yeah. It's much quicker, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't remember off the top of my head if anybody has looked at that large of a spatial scale of synchrony outside of one example I can think of was in um, marine phytoplankton blooms across both the terrestrial landscapes on earth as well as um, marine landscapes. And they definitely exhibited sort of interesting patterns of synchrony, but I don't know, I don't remember off the top of my head if it would be truly a latitudinal gradient. So, um, and I think the hard part it's probably becoming um, solvable now is that for a long time you were just limited by, you know, trying to monitor so many populations, but with sort of the increasing number of, um, uh, you know, collaborative projects across multiple spatial scales and all that kind of stuff that, you know, hopefully some of those things can be addressed. Um, you know, things that are at the occurring at the level of like a state, you know, a lot of state agencies have data that might span a large gradient. And so if that's a long enough, you know, um, you know, if a temperature gradient or whatever sort of abiotic vector you're interested in might, you know, help explain um, uh, some of those patterns. So, but yeah, definitely something interesting to think about. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, too, because you could actually use several different states' databases, right? And be able to compare. Yeah. yeah. Or I things guess. like, I mean, I know people have looked at, like, global climate change with, um, like, breeding bird survey data and some other sorts of, you know, large-scale database um, questions. Excellent. So one of the cool things I think about um, Kentucky Lake is that there's it has a it has a twin right um, more or less with Lake Barkley mm -hmm. there and so I guess I was I know you, you don't have data and I suspect there's not a long term monitoring program of zooplankton on Lake Barkley but I, I I guess I'd be interested to know what you what your gut instinct is about how, the level of synchronicity sort of between the lakes that you might see of some of those taxa um, if mm -hmm. if they'd be synchronous at all I guess. Um, I don't know for sure. Um, somebody has the data to answer a similar question to this. So, you know, a lot of folks that have, um, and that have looked at this to some degree in the Canadian Shield at the lakes up in Canada, so the Experimental Lakes area and some of those locations, as well as, you know, some of the long-term sites that um, are up in Wisconsin, that they have multi-lake data on zooplankton. I'm blanking on the name of the LTER up there, but, um, I think they have long-term data on multiple lakes where you could look at synchrony among lakes that you would expect would be very different potentially than like within the same lake or maybe obviously so that they would be very different because you know they're unlikely to be exchanging dispersers at all at that scale so um, or to be a very minor um, contributor to synchrony and so looking at things like which lakes are more similar in the environment might be more important so um so specifically to Kentucky Lake and Lake Barclay, though, um, I would suspect that they would probably be somewhat correlated, at least for the species that are subject to the environment, because I, I forget how deep that lake is relative to Kentucky Lake or for how similar the abiotic environment is. But if it's relatively similar, it's similar in morphology. So I would think that potentially for some taxa, it might be very synchronous. So just a guess. Yeah, 
Cool. Well, thanks. Um, but so with that, uh, we are at five o'clock. So we're going to um, go ahead and end the seminar for today. Um, but I want to thank everybody for watching today. And I especially want to thank Dr. Anderson um, for the great seminar he gave. So um, with that, uh, we shall uh, see you all next week. Thank you.